أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I see you have a taste for the Victorians, right? Well, now we've got another one. This... Um, parallel uh, 
in many ways the times that we have gone through ourselves recently with, with conflict um, between Western countries, particularly Britain, of course, at that time, um, and some Muslim territories. So there's a, a, a very large conflict going on in Sudan. Uh, there was conflict in Afghanistan, nothing's changed. Uh, and uh, I think in the environment of those kind of conflicts between Britain and Muslim territories around the world, uh, there was a lot of um, what I would call jingoistic um, media representation of Islam in the UK at that time, for Muslim countries. So, so a white um, British lawyer trying to promote Islam is always going to be seen um, as, as an oddity um, and maybe even dangerous. So, so there, there were certainly um, major problems for him. Um, but in spite of that, he, he carried on um, and he managed to convert around about 250 families in Liverpool and around about 500 people around Britain to Islam. Not 
So in other words, Islam in Britain is nothing to do with migration. It, it do with a religious conviction that goes back before the migrations of the 1960s. So what we have is an example of a British Muslim, a white British Muslim, um, and a white British Muslim community that was working side by side um, with what the early migrants of the 19th century, especially here in this city where there were a large number of Yemeni and Somali sailors coming in um, who used his mosque um, in Liverpool. So we have a multicultural group of Muslims um, who are effectively uh, a community of conviction, um, not a community of ethnicity. So I, I think that's the first relevance. I think the second relevance, and one which is he did not, I think, fully resolve in his life, but had to fight with, uh, would be the issue of loyalty. That how, as a Muslim living in Britain, a British Muslim, um, do you square issues around loyalty to each nation and loyalty to one's religion, um, where they conflict? That's not just a question for Muslims, of course, that may also be a question for Christians and Jews and other religious communities. But it's one that he had to grapple with. He, he was a uh, patriot, um, but he also believed that, and that as a patriot, um, a British patriot, one should engage in active citizenship. Uh, and he felt that it was the role of people who had a faith commitment um, to be engaged in active citizenship, not passive citizenship, and to be a voice of conscience, so a, voice, a voice of change in society. Uh, and throughout his life, of course, he pursued that in a number of ways. He was a trade union leader, he was a, an activist uh, against capital punishment, um, he was also involved in Negro rights, USA. So there were a number of, of what I would call social justice issues um, that Quillian involved himself in that extended wider um, than just being a, a part of the particular Muslim community. Uh, and that, that was significant to him. Um, and I think finally, I would say one of the great significances of, significance of Abdul Quillian for Muslims today would be um, the fact that he was able to create community of Muslims here in Liverpool and wider uh, that not sense bound to a particular ethnicity. Um, that's still something which the community today struggles with. Uh, it's a fact that if one goes to a mosque, um, in most of the British cities it will be a Bangladeshi mosque or a Pakistan mosque or an Indian Gujarati mosque or an Arab mosque. Um, Quilliam's mosque had 57 nationalities um, who came to prayer, and it's even in the, in the um, 1890s. Um, white converts, very poor, um, and sometimes uh, what's meant to be of, of the kind of class and respect of the society, Yemeni and Somali sailors. Um, so, very, very rich Muslims of no talk who were sometimes the whites from India were in the mosque. So here are the three different in that mosque, around about um, 1895, 96, um, you would have lined up in prayer with 57 nationalities, um, white converts from all spectrums, Victorian class, some very, very wealthy men, aristocracy, down to clerks and tradesmen, but also people who have right across the class spectrum um, amongst Muslim visitors to the country. And I still don't think that happened in the US um, which is a part of what should exist in Islam. Um, well, I guess eventually I was going to come across Abdul Quilliam. I had been a, a, a student and a, a scholar of um, the Muslim presence in Britain um, since 1988. Most of my previous writing had, had been done on the Salvation um, migrant community um, in this country as the dominant and largest group. Uh, but I became more and more intrigued by the fact that there were Muslim communities in this country prior um, to the um, Second World War, even prior to the First World War. Uh, previous scholarship had indicated that um, that presence of Muslims in the country before the First World War, or between the wars, was not very significant. Um, and I felt that scholarship was not accurate. And, and it wasn't 
that's fine with me getting um, this position at Liverpool, Hope University Science in Liverpool. Uh, it was an ideal place to begin to research what is the historical community. Um, and I guess that I was about to turn my attention to the United States Convention. In good old Queen Victoria's day, industrial revolution meant bosses said, please, we need more employees, we need a dissolution. Who will climb our chimneys? Who will power our grids? Victorian family.